Um, so we have to um, uh, uh, we have to um, um, uh, detect the two electrons, and so the situation is that we have here our nucleus, and uh, the two electrons will be emitted at some point in the nucleus, here and there, for example. So here we have an emission of an electron, and. Uh, 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 and we have to calculate what is the angular distribution of the electrons. Do they come in the forward direction or do they come with the opposite to each other? And, uh, and, and, and then we have to calculate the probability that they will have a certain energy uh, E. So we have to calculate the electron spectrum. Now to calculate the electron spectrum, we need uh, the wave functions of those electrons. And, uh, we need the wave functions. If we are doing the decay, we need the scattering wave functions, the wave functions of the electrons that are coming out from the nucleus. But the electrons are relativistic, and we cannot use just the Schrodinger equation to calculate those wave functions. So the idea then is to use the Dirac equation to calculate the scattering wave functions. So we are going to solve the Dirac equation, but not the Dirac equation for a puntiform, for a point a particle. We have to solve the Dirac equation for an extended uh, distribution. And so uh, that cannot be done analytically. The Dirac equation with the Coulomb potential for, for a distribution uh, for a point-like uh, case can be done analytically. And also you may know that the equation, the, the solutions of the Dirac equations have a singularity at r equal to zero. So we have to take into account of that singularity as well. So, so we need to solve the Dirac equation in the presence of an extended distribution. And, uh, and, uh, and we can do all, only that numerically. So I'm going to, uh, resolve the, to, to show to you how to do it. And uh, next complication is that when the electrons come out, they, they see the electron cloud, which is around there. So again, this has to be done with uh, uh, the, the solving the Dirac equation in the presence of the electron cloud. For the electron cloud, we are going to use the Thomas Fermi uh, model, uh, which is a simplified model of the electron uh, cloud. And here comes again a Majorana because in 1936, Majorana solved the differential equation associated with the Thomas Fermi distribution with, in a very elegant fashion. And he wrote the solution on the back of uh, un pacchetto di sigarette. You, know? uh, you, you probably know the story. He wrote it there on the back of, uh, of this, uh, 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 scratch the solution, and then showed to Fermi Fermi was really impressed that uh, he had found that solution. So we are going to use essentially Majorana solution to the Thomas Fermi e e equation, uh, uh, which was also retaken again by uh, Salvatore Esposito here uh, uh, later. I don't know whether he's present here in the audience, but uh, he did that, uh, <laughs> he, he took that again, so we are going to use that. So, so this is far as introduction. So the goal of this lecture, the first part of this lecture, is to solve the Dirac equation in the presence of, of this, uh, uh, in this complication. Uh, in the second part, what we are going to do, you know, we are going to assemble everything together, this piece, this piece, and this piece, to uh, compare with the current limits on the half-life, and therefore to give limits on neutrino masses. What are our current limits on neutrino masses? OK, so now I think we can uh, close this.
So, uh, repeating uh, what uh, I've said already several times, so this is a zero neutrino double beta decay, emission of two electrons or two positrons, half-life is written in this form. Here is what we want to extract, but to extract this, we need to know precisely what are these two terms. This depends on atomic physics, uh, phase space factor, this is on nuclear physics, and this is uh, uh, on particle physics. So, uh, and again, repeating what we said before, we will consider these three uh, different scenarios. One uh, with emission of subject light neutrino, heavy neutrino, or emission of uh, a myron. And also, since in recent years, there's been uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, whether or not sterile neutrinos exist. So we are going to also study the contribution of sterile neutrinos. Now, the phase space factors for the scenarios one, two, and four are the same. When there is myron emission, is different, so myron emission needs to be calculated separately. And also, the phase space factor for the resonant uh, capture uh, needs uh, separate, uh, separate attention, which uh, maybe I will discuss. But also, since uh, at, uh, the two neutrino process happens at the same time as the zero neutrino process, we need to calculate the phase space factors for two neutrino double beta decay, because this is different from zero neutrino, and therefore needs to be calculated separately. For two neutrino, it's like calculating two successive beta decays, each one of them being indicated there. So. Uh, in the 1980s, a Japanese group, uh, though it all calculated some of the space factors, they are also uh, reported in the book of uh, uh, Felix Bam and uh, Fogel. Uh, but these are, uh, uh, use approximate expression for the electron wave functions at the nucleus. And therefore, recently, uh, uh, the PSF have been recalculated with exact direct, exact means, uh, uh, numerical exact, electron wave functions and including screening by the electron cloud. And uh, these are also available from uh, 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 Yeni Kotila, and they are available also in this uh, uh, web page uh, where they can be extracted. In fact, for the experimentalist, this is the most useful aspect of our calculations because they have used this uh, to, to, to uh, compare with their data on two neutrinos. So, uh, electron uh, decays, uh, so uh, first of all, two neutrino electron decays, two electrons are emitted and two antineutrinos. In uh, neutrino less instead of just two electrons. And so, the wave functions are obtained by solving numerically the Dirac equation with the following potential. Uh, outside of the uh, nucleus, so the potential is just the Coulomb potential of the daughter nucleus. Inside the nucleus, uh, it is uh, the potential of a spherical uh, charge distribution uh, multiplied by function phi, which is the function that is obtained numerically by solving the Thomas Fermi equation. Here is the Thomas Fermi equation, which is a second order uh, differential equation, but with the phi to the three halves, uh, and, uh, and with some uh, values here of, uh, uh, of uh, the units uh, B. Uh, that we have uh, at our um, uh, in this process. Now the boundary conditions are such that the final nucleus is a positive ion with the charge plus two, uh, and uh, uh, the boundary conditions are that uh, the Thomas Fermi at the origin is one, and the Thomas Fermi at infinity is two divided by the uh, charge of the daughter nucleus. And here is the uh, reference to Esposito, but the method of solution was suggested by Ettore Majorana in 1936. So the wave functions then are positive energy Dirac central field wave functions. Here is the upper component and the lower component of those wave functions. Chi are the spinners, spherical spinners, and these are the radial functions which depend on the energy epsilon of the electron and on the radial coordinate R. This is a standard form of uh, the 
uh, the um, uh, positive energy scattering solutions of the Dirac equation. Uh, now the energy epsilon uh, uh, is here and the kappa is uh, this quantity which depends on the orbital angular momentum and the total angular momentum j. And uh, the radial uh, wave functions satisfy the coupled uh, differential equations which are the Dirac uh, coupled differential equations with the potential v and, uh, and energy epsilon. There is not much to say. So we have to solve these two equations uh, uh, because they are coupled and we can reduce them to a single second order differential equation if we wish like it is usually done in the, in the books in quantum mechanics, uh, but we do it numerically, so we solve it numerically. Then once we have solved those equations, we are in a position to calculate the uh, differential decay rate, which is written in this form. So uh, uh, this form in involves uh, the uh, uh, neutrino energies called omega here, the electron energies, the two electrons, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, the angle between the two electrons. So, uh, so this is uh, the form of the differential decay rate. And then this quantity W2 nu uh, depends on the GA, the axial vector coupling constant to the fourth power, the Fermi constant G, the Kabibo angle, the cosine of the Kabibo angle, some bunch of uh, uh, pi and 64, uh, in some earlier calculation, there were some, some errors. Instead of 64, here there was 32. Uh, uh, so there was a factor of two, but this has been corrected. Then uh, uh, here there are again the neutrino energies and, and uh, uh, the momenta and the energies. So this is a standard calculation. It's a complicated, but it's a standard calculation. Then one can obtain the phase space factors called the G0 and G1. Uh, in units of year to the minus one. And from this, one can calculate uh, uh, <clears throat> this quantity nu, which is the product of GA to the fourth, uh, some scale, which is, we have taken the electron scale, the matrix element square, which is this, and then combine together to the half-life, multiplying by this quantity nu by the sp phase space factors that we have uh, calculated before. But also all other uh, quantities can be calculated. These are of interest to the experimentalist. Uh, we have seen the differential decay rate, the sum the energy spectrum of the two electrons, the angular correlations between the two electrons, and the double differential uh, rate. So here is an example of this calculation, which is of interest in an experiment done in the United States called EXO. A spokesperson of the experiment is Giorgio Gratta. Uh, oh, who is originally is Italian and uh, was first with INFN but then decided to go to the United States and now is professor in Stanford. He is leading this experiment EXO, which is done in a mine uh, underground in the United States. And uh, um, it uses as material xenon 136. And so the, the decay is from 136 xenon to 136 barium. And uh, here is the differential uh, rate. Here is the sum electron spectrum. This is what they measure directly. These quantities they measure directly. And here is the angular correlations. So the two electrons are preferably emitted uh, e either with uh, angle zero or with angle pi. Uh, so although there is not really that much difference, they're sort of somewhat isotropically emitted. This is important for them to design the detectors uh, that uh, are going to detect the, 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 the electrons. Now, just uh, this is a small note that if one measure uh, accurately, uh, one can distinguish between uh, the two appro approximations that we discussed uh, yesterday, the so-called single state dominance or the closure approximation and here is an example for the experiment going from palladium to cadmium, which is of interest to an experiment called the COBRA, which eventually will come to the Gran Sasso, but uh, right now is only in the designing phase. Uh, uh, and uh, you see that the two different approximations uh, here produce a difference in the uh, low energy part 
of the, the single electron uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, and so if one could measure this accurately for two neutrinos, then one may, may be able to tell the difference between the two. Now, similar story for neutrino-less double beta decay. The differential rate uh, is uh, given uh, by this expression now. There is uh, just uh, uh, neutrinos uh, disappeared. Uh, and so there is only the energy of one of the electrons, the angle between the two electrons. And here, this depends uh, uh, once more on uh, the GA, the Fermi coupling constant, the Kabibo angle, and some other powers of pi. And uh, uh, here there is the momentum of the electrons, P1 and P2, and the energy of the electrons here, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. And each quantity is obtained by integrating over those uh, uh, variables so, uh, for that, which are obtained from the solution of the Dirac equation. So and again, a, a standard but complicated uh, derivation, one obtains these uh, two form factors. Uh, and from this, uh, one can uh, uh, calculate the half-life, which will involve uh, the uh, phase space factors times this quantity n, but this quantity n in turn is the axial vector coupling constant, the nuclear matrix elements, and the, the physics beyond the standard model. And the two scenarios that are uh, uh, always considered are either light neutrino exchange in which the quantity f is proportional to the neutrino mass or heavy neutrino exchange where the quantity f is inversely proportional to the neutrino mass. So for light neutrino exchange, the larger is the mass, the larger is this quantity. Uh, 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 um, for uh, heavy neutrino, the largest is the mass, the smaller is, is this quantity. So they have this opposite uh, behavior to which uh, we are going to come back uh, uh, perhaps uh, later. Uh, and then from this one can calculate all the other quantities, the single electron spectrum, the angular correlations between the two electrons, and the double differential uh, rate. And here is an example which is of importance to the experiment Gerda, uh, which has been going on at the Grand Sasso uh, from the uh, decay of Germanium 76. Uh, here is the single electron spectrum, and here is the angular correlations uh, for uh, the emission of uh, the two electrons in the absence of neutrinos. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, these uh, quantities that are needed to analyze the experiment if eventually this uh, process will be observed experimentally. In this uh, uh, slide, there is a comparison between approximate and exact uh, prescreening phase space factors uh, <clears throat> uh, in a logarithmic scale. And uh, so the correction is not negligible for these heavy nuclei. Remember that all this effect or oh, like Z alpha, alpha is a fine structure constant. Uh, uh, so uh, the Coulomb potential is of the order Z alpha, but the uh, screening correction is of the order Z alpha squared. Uh, so one order of, of alpha less. And so, uh, but still it contains Z. And therefore the larger is Z, the larger is the charge of the nucleus. The, the more is the larger is the correction. So for example, for uranium, it's already a correction of a factor of uh, two or so uh, in, the, in the phase space factor. So which for the experiment is important, uh, these factors is important. Now, a similar situation is now for positron decays. Uh, there is not much difference, except uh, that the boundary conditions are now are different. So this is the case where uh, two positrons are emitted and two neutrinos. Uh, and, uh, uh, but in this case, there is also the possibility that uh, one electron is captured from uh, the uh, atom. And so the nucleus AZ captures an electron and uh, is transformed in the nucleus AZ minus two 
and then a positron is emitted into two neutrinos, or even more so, two neutrino double electron capture is the process where two electrons are, are uh, uh, coming from uh, the, the atom, uh, they are absorbed from the atom, and, uh, and uh, then the two neutrinos are emitted. For neutrinoless uh, double positron decay, uh, same situation as far as the emission of the two positrons, same situation about emitting a positron and absorbing an electron. This process is called zero nu beta plus electron capture. But, uh, but uh, uh, in the case, uh, sorry, the case in which uh, two electrons are are absorbed from uh, the atom cannot occur because we cannot in this case conserve energy and momentum so there is no zero new electron capture electron capture double electron capture cannot occur because we cannot conserve energy and momentum so the two electrons disappear uh, and, and we cannot conserve the energy momentum they're absorbed by the nucleus but who takes the energy the momentum or, or to to, to, to have that process, so that process cannot, cannot occur. Okay, so for all of these problems, we need the wave functions. For beta plus decay, we still need uh, uh, the scattering uh, uh, state wave functions, which are now the negative energy Dirac uh, 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 central field wave functions. Again, uh, with upper component and the lower component are now exchanged. Uh, and again, chi are spherical spinners, and F and G are the radial functions uh, with energy epsilon, uh, and uh, which depend on the relativistic quantum number uh, kappa, which is uh, given by this. So this is the same as uh, beta minus decay, but for a change in sign of the Sommerfeld parameter uh, epsilon, which is uh, Z square over H bar um, uh, V. Uh, and uh, and so it's just a change. This is a standard calculation of quantum mechanics uh, uh, too, uh, uh, but uh, which in this case requires to be done uh, uh, numerically. Now, for electron capture, now it's a different story because electron capture, we need the bound state wave functions, not scattering wave functions. And the bound state wave functions are now labeled by the principal quantum number n and uh, uh, the relativistic quantity kappa and uh, uh, mu, mu appears here in the spinner, uh, where n prime denotes the radial quantum number and the quantum number kappa is related to total angular momentum by this expression. And uh, explicit calculations have been done for k shell electrons uh, where the principal quantum number is zero. These are S states. These are the lowest states of the, of the atom, 1 S, 1 F. For L1 shell electrons uh, with the principal quantum number one, and this is the 2 S, 1, 2. So these are the dominant one because uh, the electrons are captured from the atom, and so there must be some probability that they are found at the location of the nucleus and therefore S waves, are S states are only the important ones. And the, the, uh, the uh, L2 and L3 capture, or M1, M2, and M3 captures can be neglected because they are suppressed by non-zero angular momentum. This is true for this process, but for the experiment that uh, uh, Pallavicini and company are interested on electron capture of an ormium 163, one needs to do captures also from the M shells and so on, from the IS shells. Okay, so this is obtained again numerically uh, uh, as in the case of uh, double electron decay, but with the potentials now, which uh, have different signs, uh, because now for the uh, uh, beta plus, beta plus, uh, the sign is different than beta minus, beta minus. And so here is indicated what the signs are, where D denotes the daughter nucleus and M the mother nucleus. And this is a Thomas Fermi equation with bound different boundary conditions, which are different from double electron, double positron, electron capture, or, or a single positron. 
And here is the Fermi, the Fermi function, uh, Thomas Fermi function, as a function of the coordinates x, which is a dimensionless quantity. And so here are the results again. Uh, they are very similar to the case of, uh, of uh, um, uh, beta minus beta minus as far as, uh, as uh, the uh, two nu are, are, are concerned and also as far as the zero nu are concerned. The only case that uh, causes some problems is the resonant uh, double electron capture, which as I mentioned already before, cannot occur because of energy momentum conservation. Uh, so it can only occur if accidentally the energy of the initial state is precisely identical to the energy of the final state. But this can never occur because we need to be uh, precise within uh, a few electron volts. Uh, and so the only way that this can happen is if we include the width of the final state. This is atomic state, not nuclear state. So we have to introduce the width of, we have to calculate the width of the uh, final uh, uh, atomic state. And then, uh, then this process can occur because of the width. So the half-life is going to depend on uh, the width of this state and also how much mismatch there is there, uh, which is called the degeneracy parameter and which is uh, the Q value of the reaction, the energy of the two electrons the holes uh, and the energy E. So again, this is a very complicated atomic uh, uh, physics uh, uh, calculation that uh, we have done here, but also has been done by uh, Sinkovich and uh, uh, Dieter Frecker so, uh, some uh, time ago. Very complicated atomic calculation. And the, all the information is contained in the so-called prefactor, which is like uh, the phase space factors. And for that, we need uh, positive energy, Dirac central field, the bound state uh, uh, wave functions, which we calculate uh, numerically. Then the crucial quantity in this case is the probability that an electron is found at the nucleus. And uh, this probability is a bunch of uh, uh, pi's and c's and h bar c and so on. Uh, and then it is uh, the square of the way of the Dirac wave functions at the location of the nucleus, which is the square of the upper component uh, and the square of the lower component in the Dirac equation. Uh, and this have to be calculated uh, numerically. And then uh, one can have K capture or L1 capture and also higher order captures if one is needed. And so the uh, prefactor is now um, G, uh, Fermi constant, the Cabibo angle. Uh, and then uh, here we have uh, uh, some normalization which involves the electron mass to the seventh power. Uh, and then we have the uh, uh, square of the overlap uh, here. Uh, for double electron capture, we have two of these factors because two electrons are captured uh, from, uh, from the atom. And so by means of that, we can calculate uh, um, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, you probably cannot see from the back the stable, but the important point is only that we can calculate all this so-called enhancement factor, because the idea is that if the energy released there is zero, then there will be an enhancement factor. And so uh, the enhancement factor uh, called F for some nuclei like adolinium 152 and the corresponding atom is about a factor of 10. So we gain a factor of 10 relatively to the measurements uh, of um, the usual measurements of zero neutrino uh, um, uh, double beta decay. So and this is the reason why this has stimulated the several experimentalists to try to measure uh, this process in these uh, particular uh, cases here. Um, uh, so because of this large enhancement uh, factor, uh, which is, uh, is uh, 
of, uh, of interest. Also here there is the mismatch in the energy, which you can see is of the order of uh, uh, KV uh, between the initial and the final state. Now, finally, uh, to conclude this part about the phase space factor, there is the calculation of Majoran uh, emission, um, which is the process in which uh, uh, two electrons are emitted together with a, 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 a scalar massless particle, uh, chi zero, or two of these uh, particles, uh, massless particles, two chi zero. The neutrino here is light neutrino uh, that is coupled to the Majoran. And uh, uh, then uh, we, one can calculate the differential rate for this process in a similar fashion. So there is here the energy of the electrons, but here this de depends on the Majoran. And, uh, on the, and uh, there is a very complicated calculation, then one can obtain the PS factors. And so final result for this case is that uh, the inverse of life is this phase space factor that we calculate, the nuclear matrix elements, and then the coupling constant between the neutrino and the Majoran, which is here indicated by G. Uh, George I. Glashow and Nusinov were the first one to study this, uh, this uh, process. And uh, uh, they, of course, one cannot say what is the coupling constant or if this particle exists at all. But nonetheless, now the calculation is available for, for the phase space factors for this uh, process uh, as well. Uh, there are several suggestions of what type of uh, particle is the Majoran, whether it, it is a, a, a number Goston boson uh, or not. And, uh, and uh, I gave a list in the first lecture. But if someone is interested, I can give uh, more references in my lecture notes that are included more references to that. Okay, so these are then the results for the phase space factors. But you see that again, uh, they are rather small. They are 10 to the minus 18 in inverse years. So this process is even more difficult to detect than the previous processes. And, uh, and so people are very pessimistic that anything can be done. Uh, even in the best of cases in which the, the phase space factors are large, like in the case of just one Majoran emission um, uh, with the spectral index one, where the phase space factors in these units become large, but nonetheless, uh, uh, I mean, this kills you completely. And certainly to detect uh, uh, possibility of more than one Majoran, like here. You see, look, this impossible, practical. So this is sort of more academic calculation than uh, anything else, uh, because it looks like this process uh, is very difficult uh, to uh, detect. Um, so uh, next thing is also that the decay, uh, some people have suggested that the decay uh, can occur through an excited state. And this, since this is a part of a core experiment, I'm going to mention it. So this is the decay of the lurin 130, which could go either to the ground state of xenon or to excited state of uh, on one excited state. The nuclear matrix element for these processes are comparable, but the phase space factor is different. And so if we look at the ratio of the half-lives going to the second state to the first state, there is a factor of 80, which comes in part from the square of the matrix element, where the factor is not so large, but especially from the phase space factor, because the Q value of the reaction is different. The reason why experimentalists are interested in this is because then they can look at the gamma rays which come out from the decay of, um, of uh, the excited state. And uh, looking at gamma rays, as we know from our gammas, as we know from a recent result on LHC, uh, this is a, a very sensitive test. We know that LHC is now this result of a mass of about 750 MeV 
obtained by analyzing the spectrum of two gammas, uh, uh, gamma gamma coming uh, uh, at the, at the NNC. Eh? This is very recent, very recent, uh, still not confirmed. Uh, yeah, not confirmed, not confirmed. It's only two standard deviations away, and so it's not confirmed. Also, it's the same effect. Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be very interesting if this is uh, going to. And here the idea is similar. Look at the gamma. Eh? The statistics is not uh, is only two sigma uh, way. <laughs> of course, it would be very exciting if uh, this will be seen. It will open up a new avenue. Huh? Yes. Yes. Or oh, also other, but that depends on the way this particle is coupled. <laughs> it's not maybe X-like type of particle, so it, we, 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 we don't know. So, but this is sort of a, a detour. So, so there are uh, quarry will attend a measurement of, uh, of uh, decay to the zero plus, excited zero plus, by looking at this uh, E2 transition from the zero plus to the first two plus state and focusing on that uh, tr transition uh, and uh, to see whether they see anything. But uh, this number indicates that Pratim is going to be impossible uh, to see. Okay, so how are we going to do with time? Uh, uh, we have arranged for some, uh, no, no, tell me. Um, so, Okay, so I, w I would like to go maybe another few minutes, okay. and then we'll stop, and then we'll, we'll continue. Partly it's because uh, to talk for a long, long time is, <laughs> is a problem. Okay, so let me, to conclude this part about uh, the phase space, uh, uh, phase space factors, um, uh, they've been uh, um, uh, used uh, by all the experimental groups working in this, uh, in, in this field, in particular by EXO, which is the experiment on xenon done in the United States uh, by Grata and collaborators, by Gerda, which is the experiment at the Gran Sasso using 76 germanium, by SuperNemo, which is an experiment in uh, the, 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 uh, the group that does this experiment, is a French group, uh, together with others, and the SuperNemo looks at various nuclei, not only just one or two. Uh, and then there is Quare, uh, which is uh, used, uh, uh, which is at the Gran Sasso. Gerda and Quare are of particular interest to INFN because they are done at the Gran Sasso, and especially Quare is of great interest. And so all of these uh, have used the phase space factors that we have calculated uh, uh, in analyzing their data or in uh, doing simulations of what they should expect in case uh, uh, these processes will be seen. And here is an example of the observed spectrum of two neutrino double beta decay. So here is the energy and uh, here are the data. And you may see a curve there which is the result of uh, our calculation. So, uh, um, um, the calculation for the phase space factors does not uh, 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 gives you the distribution, but not, does not give the absolute value because the absolute value here depends on the nuclear matrix elements. And so, the way that this is, fit has been done is by using the, the, the calculation of phase space factors and adjusting the, the, uh, this, the strength here um, uh, to fit uh, uh, the, uh, the, this point here. But you see that the behavior is very well uh, described. There are here details because the, there, there are some things on top of that. And so the experimentalists have looked at the deviations from uh, uh, the, from, uh, the um, uh, uh, theoretical curve and these are the uh, re residues 
here, but the residues appear to be very small, and so, and so it looks like uh, we are calculating the phase space factors accurately. Now, uh, for simulations, and this I mentioned for the experimentalists, uh, 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 one may also need uh, the triple differential rate uh, in terms of the energy of the two electrons and the angle between the two electrons. Uh, this was not reported in the original uh, publications that we did in 2012, but it can be extracted easily from the program, and now it's available. So for Quare, this is of importance in trying to, to, to make simulations of what we expect for the signal uh, in case eventually uh, this uh, um, uh, zero neutrino uh, will be observed, but also they need it for two neutrinos. Uh, so uh, this has been provided uh, to, to them to be able to do uh, that. Okay, so I think this is a good place where uh, to stop for, for a moment. And, uh, and the bottom line of this now, all phase space factors for all processes are all available. That is... So uh, we are now at the final stage uh, of this uh, uh, presentation, of these lectures. So in previous uh, lectures, we have uh, calculated the nuclear matrix elements and uh, phase space factors. And uh, also we have discussed uh, what is uh, the physics beyond the standard model that we wish to study. And, uh, uh, and then we have uh, written the inverse half-life in this form. So now we have uh, all the ingredients uh, to calculate the expected uh, half-lives for this uh, uh, process. And so here are the latest results for neutrinoless double beta decay. The expected half-lives, please note, in the 10 to 24th years is larger than the age of the universe. So this process is a very rare process, 10 to the 24th uh, uh, years, very rare process. And, uh, uh, and here is as a function of mass number. This uh, uh, result here is uh, uh, assuming that the average neutrino mass is one electron volt. If it is less than one, one electron volt, uh, there has to be scaled up or down. Um, and uh, also assuming that the axial vector coupling constant is uh, the free value of 1.269. Uh, no quenching. This is no quenching. And from this, one can see that the best case is uranium, but unfortunately, this is not good for the experiment. We cannot use uranium. Uh, there's lots of alphas coming out. So the next best case is neodymium. And in fact, uh, when we suggested this, uh, there was an attempt to use neodymium for a double charge exchange, but we need one particular isotope of neodymium, 150, and to get enriched neodymium, becomes a problem. The only people who can enrich neodymium are the Russians, but they are not willing to give enough their neodymium uh, uh, to, for, this, uh, for doing double beta decay. So neodymium, which was the original plan at Snow Plus, has now been excluded. So no, neodymium cannot be done. So uh, uh, the uh, current experiments are either in tellurium, that's quarry, or in Germanium, that's, uh, uh, that is uh, Gerda, or in Xenon, that's Kamland and Exo. So these are the current four experiments. There is a, a planned experiment in France, uh, I mean, a uh, French group, on do it on molybdenum, which is another good case, but we'll see whether this, uh, this uh, pro proceeds um, or, or not. 
So at the moment, the experiments are tellurium, uh, xenon, uh, germanium, uh, and uh, these three are the three cases that have been used. Now, this is the situation for double positron or positron uh, electron capture. Uh, but as you can see now, the half-life may even longer, 10 to 27. The best cases are once more xenon, uh, barium, and, uh, and cerium, uh, which are uh, here. So the people at, uh, um, uh, at Camland are planning also to look for two positrons coming out and see whether they can detect uh, this. And again, this is no quenching. What? Uh, the phase space factor. The Q value is smaller. And it goes like the Q value to the fifth power. Uh, these are the expected half-lives for resonant electron, double electron capture. Best case appears to be tungsten and gadolinium. An experiment in gadolinium is being planned at the moment in the United States to see whether one can observe this process there. For major on emission, the situation is similar to the other previous cases. Again, the best case is uh, once more neodymium, but uh, tellurium, they are all of the same order of magnitude. Although in this case, the scale here is logarithmic, while before we had the scale with, uh, with uh, Okay, so now we have, uh, we have uh, those expected half-life, so we can put some limits on uh, neutrino masses from the expected uh, half-lives and the experimental limits on them, one can set the limits for the neutrino masses. And what are these limits? Now, this is the situation uh, now. There are various experiments that they've tested that they put some limits on the half-life of zero neutrino decay, going from calcium, germanium, selenium, zircon, molybdenum, palladium, all the way down to neodymium-150. Uh, although you cannot see them from the back, uh, these are the, the references uh, that you can see. It. Uh, there is uh, uh, Gerda here, there is Exo, there is Kamlan Zen. There is no quarry yet because quarry is going to produce the results uh, hopefully in a year from now. Um, and also there is the result of a claim to have observed uh, this by a clapter uh, that has claimed that has observed it and the claim is there. So the best limit so far comes from uh, this es experiment here, which is Kamland, Kamland Zen called collaboration, uh, which is published in 2013, they set a limit of 1.9, 10 to 25 years, and this gives a, a, a limit on the mass of neutrino must be less than 0.2 electron volts. What? È stato escluso, adesso lo farò vedere esplicitamente. Independent of the I will show a picture with the hierarchy now in a moment. So this is the limit. Now we can also put the limits on heavy uh, uh, neutrino exchange. This is now the other way around. So the mass here coming from Kamlan Zen must be greater than 250 uh, GeV. So if there are heavy neutrinos, they must have a mass larger than that possibly of the order of one TV or larger. All of these are with uh, uh, no quenching. And here is the summary of the results uh, compared to the inverted hierarchy and the normal hierarchy. So uh, this graph uh, shows the average mass in electron volt uh, as a function of the lightest neutrino mass. Um, this is the expected values for inverted or normal uh, based on oscillation experiments. Uh, 
that have measured uh, the mass differences and also from experiments that have measured the uh, angles, the mixing angles, uh, theta 1, 2, theta 1, 3, and theta 2, 3. Uh, this is the latest result, including Daya Bay of, two, 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 of uh, a year ago, two years ago. So these are the expected value, and here is Klaptor. So you can see that uh, uh, although Klaptor was still consistent with the degenerate uh, uh, masses, it is now excluded by Gerda, Exo, and Kamlan Z to several sigma deviations. Four or five sigma deviation of X and Kamlan Zen exclude, uh, exclude Klaptor. So Klaptor now is uh, essentially excluded. Okay, so uh, the conclusion of this part then is uh, now we have all the formulas we needed. We have calculated nuclear matrix element, uh, phase path of all processes. And therefore, we calculate the spectra of lives uh, uh, for all uh, the processes that are indicated there. However, we still have one, uh, uh, as I said before, one of these dolenti note, that is uh, all these estimates are done with no quenching. And uh, the current best limit with no quenching is from Kamland, as I said several times, with the mass about uh, less than 0.2 electron volts. And uh, uh, the exploration of the inverted region would require more than one ton, because as you saw there, we are still not at the expected uh, um, uh, inverted region. And if we don't go to the normal region, which, has, which is mainly electron volts, then we need a large experiment greater, much greater than one ton. For every neutrino, the limit is model dependent. The, the model of uh, Visani and, and others, uh, the current best limit from Kamlan Zen is uh, mass of the heavy neutrino greater than uh, 2.57 GeV. Of course, th this is model dependent because we have to assume whatever it is the mass of the W right uh, boson, which we, t we took at the 3.5 TV. If that is uh, uh, one TV, then the limit becomes much larger. So this is model dependent. Uh, 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 depends on the model in which the heavy neutrinos are, are uh, introduced. But now we have to come to the major uh, new question, which is what is the actual value of GA in this nuclei? And, and this uh, is, has been a subject of many papers in recent years, many papers in recent years. Um, and there are three possible scenarios. One is that the GA is the free value, which is uh, obtained from the decay of the neutron into proton, electron, antineutrino, which is 1.27, 1.26. The other possibility is that GA is the quark value. If uh, they couple directly to the quarks, then uh, GA is one. The coupling is one, so that's the quark value. The other one is the one that takes into account all those, uh, those nuclear physics effect, which here is called the maximal quenching, which can be parameterized in this uh, relatively simple form. It's a power law. And so you see that the GA decreases, as say, increases, although not with a very large power, but still it, it decreases. And I think I've discussed this in the previous uh, uh, lectures. So there is a recent article by Visani. There, there are our papers. There is an article by several others trying to understand this. So if GA is normalized to the value that is observed in single beta decay or in two beta decay with uh, two neutrinos, which I discussed in lecture two, all estimates should be increased by a factor of 416, and that will make it impossible to reach in the immediate future even the inverted region. So even the inverted region is going to be difficult to reach. 
Now, there are several possibilities to escape this very negative conclusion. So first of all, still the solution in which the neutrino masses are degenerate at large is okay, but this is in tension with the cosmological bound on the sum of the neutrino masses, which I briefly discussed in lecture one. So could, they could be large, but then they are in tension with this because then cosmological bound now is down to 0.2 electron volts, and so this will be in tension with that. A second possibility is that uh, both mechanisms, light and heavy, contribute simultaneously. They are of the same order of magnitude, and they interfere constructively. So light in neutrino is proportional to the neutrino mass, light in neutrino mass. Heavy neutrino is inversely proportional to the heavy neutrino mass. And if for some reason, uh, this would require a fine tuning such that they will add constructively, they are of the same order of magnitude, but this possibility is quite unlikely. This fine tuning, I don't see any reason why it should be there. And so this, uh, this fine tuning may be rather, it's, it's, in my opinion, is very unlikely. So the only possibility remaining is that other scenarios, for example, myron emission or new mechanisms, for example, the presence of sterile neutrinos may contribute. So here is once more graph with, uh, with uh, uh, myron emission. The antineutrino emitted here uh, changes, emits a myron and then, uh, and then uh, becomes a, a, a neutrino, uh, and then again it emits. So myron here means a massless uh, neutral uh, boson. The fourth scenario is that here a sterile neutrino is emitted. Sterile here means uh, with no standard model interactions. And I mentioned that uh, Pontecorvo was uh, the first person, I think, to mention this possibility, although it was quite early on, it was 50 years ago almost, uh, and uh, now the situation is what it is. So, so these are other uh, possibilities. So let us uh, investigate a little bit more in detail these possibilities. So first of all, my own emission. Then uh, uh, this is a process that I've denoted by zero nu double beta chi decay, the half-life now has been calculated because we have calculated the phase space factor, we have calculated the nuclear matrix element, and so we can put a limit on what is the effective Majoron coupling constant. The nuclear matrix element here are the same as scenario one and two, but the PSF, the phase space factors, are different, and so we have recalculated them recently. Originally, this scenario was suggested by Georgia, Glashov, and Nusinov, and then several other people, and, uh, uh, and we have analyzed uh, this uh, scenario. And although you cannot see it because, unfortunately, this did not come out well, but uh, the uh, current limit on uh, uh, the coupling constant for myrons is 10 to the minus 5. So they are coupled very weakly to the uh, neutrinos, and, uh, and uh, uh, the coupling, the limit at the moment, since the process has not been observed, the limit coming from uh, Kamlan Zen uh, is, uh, is 10 to the minus 5, essentially. Very weakly uh, coupled, and we can give the limit. So we come now to the final uh, possible uh, scenario, which is the occurrence of sterile neutrinos. So this is uh, um, uh, the mixing of additional sterile neutrinos. Now, some of you may know that the question of whether or not sterile neutrinos exist is uh, at the moment a very active area of research uh, with experiments uh, both at Fermilab and at CERN LAC. CERN -LAC there, is, uh, there is a search for sterile neutrinos. Um, um, uh, there is an experiment, in fact, uh, searching for that. At Fermilab, this is going to be the major research program 
of Fermilab in the new scenario where because of the accord between uh, CERN and Fermilab, all neutrino physics will be done at Fermilab. And so uh, the current, what? Or in Japan, of course. Oh, Japan did not come to the meeting that we had last summer because they said they want to do everything by themselves. They don't want to get involved <laughs> with the Europeans, and the especially they don't want to get involved with the Americans because the Japanese think that the Americans are not reliable partners. <laughs> it's a folklore <laughs> story. <laughs> so, so the accord was signed only by uh, CERN and the Fermilab. <laughs> but the Japan, in fact, is going to do most of this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, experiment. So, so Fermilab has this plan now to have three detectors, one uh, near, one uh, mid-size, and one a little bit farther away to see whether there are, there are uh, uh, sterile neutrinos. So, um, um, so we have calculated the nuclear matter strength for this scenario very recently. They've just been published uh, last year, uh, late last year. But PSF is not a problem because they are the same as scenarios one and two. But the nuclear matter strength need to be calculated. And uh, so all the half-lives now can be written in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, formula a simple formula uh, which gives the inverse half-life uh, part from GA, the, the axial vector coupling constant, the uh, phase space factor, the nuclear matrix element. But now here there are all the contributions of all the possible neutrinos. So capital N indicates any uh, neutrino, not only, only the three one. Uh, and, uh, uh, if the mass of the neutrino is zero, then this goes back to the old formula in which the uh, uh, nuclear matrix element are separated uh, completely. Uh, otherwise, we have to do more complicated. And here, P squared, which is uh, some ratio here uh, uh, in some appropriate uh, unit, is, uh, is written in this form. So in case there is only one sterile neutrino mass Mn, there is no sum, and the, the coupling is uh, uh, you, uh, the coupling of this additional neutrino with the electron is Un, and there is no sum. So now, from the experimental limits, we can construct an exclusion plot of what are the values that are excluded. So in this exclusion plot, here is the mass of the neutrino in GeV, ranging from uh, all the way uh, from MeV to to uh, to uh, uh, TeV, and uh, if you remember when I showed the nuclear matrix element, uh, it turns out that the nuclear matrix element have a peak at uh, at the value of 100 MeV. Uh, if so, if the mass uh, of the neutrino, sterile neutrino is, is 100 MeV, then there is a, a considerable enhancement uh, uh, of the uh, uh, nuclear matrix elements. And therefore, this in the exclusion plot will correspond to a minimum in, in, in the exclusion plot. These different lines are various experiments, uh, Kamlan Zen, Exo, Gerda, and Quaret Zero. Quaret Zero just published uh, their first results with just one detector. So, so this is uh, now the this region is excluded, uh, and uh, since it depends both on the mass and on the coupling to the electron neutrinos. Now, unfortunately, the situation is worse if we include uh, uh, the renormalization of GA, the quenching of GA, and here are these three curves are for GA. 1.269 for GA equal to 1 and for GA the maximal uh, quenching. So we still have uh, an order of magnitude there of uncertainty. Now, several types of sterile neutrinos, as you probably know, have been uh, suggested. Everybody has his own uh, view of what sterile neutrinos are. First of all, there are sterile neutrinos with masses over the order of the electron volt. 
uh, especially Carlo Giunti, Marco Lavader have suggested this. Uh, there is a fourth, fifth, sixth, maybe neutrino with the masses in the EV range. And these uh, are introduced to account for the reno uh, reactor anomaly in oscillation experiments. Um, and uh, uh, they are in this range. Then there are heavy sterile neutrinos with the masses much greater than one electron volts, in particular the masses in the KVGV range, suggested especially by Sasha Shaposhnikov. And in fact, uh, the experiment at CERN LHC is looking for this type of neutrinos, uh, sterile neutrinos, four, five, six. I've called this A, this B. So, here is uh, the hypothetical neutrino mass uh, spectrum. These are the three known neutrinos which have uh, masses on the scale of milli electron volts. Then there are the neutrinos suggested by, by uh, Junti others of uh, light sterile which have masses in electron volt KV. There are those suggested by Asaka, Shaboshnikov and others which with the masses here, and then they have the very heavy neutrinos which are responsible for the CISO mechanism. Uh, they should be there, but it's also known. So the only thing we know at the moment is that we have these three types of neutrinos. All this is, is, is a speculation, and here the scale is a logarithmic scale. So there could be a fourth neutrino, could be some others, but uh, um, at the moment we do not know. So. Finally, we have calculated the contributions of all hypothetical neutrinos. Um, so, uh, so then the afterlife includes uh, all the contributions. The ones for light, the known neutrinos can be uh, uh, written simply because it can be factorized. The one for unknown heavy sterile neutrinos is here. The unknown light sterile is here and then the unknown heavy neutrinos are here. And in this formula, the values of M and of B in IBM2 have been calculated and they are available uh, from uh, this article in uh, FISREV uh, D uh, just uh, a few months ago. So now we have to complete the picture and of particular interest, because it's the case that many people think may be there, is the case of uh, uh, um, uh, a light sterile neutrino, a fourth neutrino, uh, so which will contribute. Now, just to see what is the effect of this fourth neutrino on double beta decay, let us consider the case in which we have a mass of the neutrino of the order of one electron volt, and the coupling of the neutrino, the fourth neutrino to the electron neutrino of 0 0.03, which is quite a sizable coupling. And then the average mass, this is the contribution of the three known neutrino species. And then here is the contribution of the fourth neutrino. And of course, we have to take into account that this may have a phase. And so this, there is a mass M4 and there is a phase alpha 4 relatively to the others. And so this will be the contribution. So the presence of a sterile fourth neutrino gives a major contribution to the, to the average mass, uh, because, especially if the coupling is of this order of magnitude. And so to, sh to show what is the effect on this uh, uh, Visani plot, we see that now with the presence of fourth neutrino, all this region is filled, and now the normal has gone up quite a lot relative to the uh, inverted. And so if there is a fourth neutrino, then we may be able to actually see it in the next generation of experiments. So if there is a fourth neutrino mass one electron volt with the coupling uh, of 0 0.03, uh, then we may see it either with the Quare or with the Gerda 2. So this has given a lot of hope to the people 
who are working in this area because uh, this is within reach. This we can see. Now, also, this is another implication because I've put here the cosmological bound to the sum of the masses with this red light here. So, uh, by combining the cosmological bound to the measurement, to the limits, on the, we may begin to disregard some of these, uh, these uh, theories pretty soon some of these uh, suggestions about uh, sterile neutrinos pretty soon, because we are not too far. Because here we are limited, we limit, we exclude all of this stuff here. And here, if we bring this down with the camera Zen, certainly in the next experiment, it will be down to this, uh, to this area. And so we'll begin to exclude some of these uh, suggestions for uh, sterile neutrinos. So that's an important point. So, uh, so sterile neutrinos contribute uh, in a sizable way to double beta decay. And so with this, I'm coming to the final uh, conclusion. And that is that uh, uh, if neutrinoless double beta decay is observed, it will answer some of the fundamental questions that we have in neutrino physics. In other words, what is the absolute neutrino mass scale, whether neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana particles, because just the observation of, of the, uh, double, or the uh, neutrinoless double beta decay will indicate it has to be a Majorana particle because the neutrino must be the same as the antineutrino so that it can be emitted at one vertex and reabsorb the other vertex. And also the question that has come up uh, very recently how many neutrino species are there? Again, I would like to remind you the cosmological bound is not only on the sum of the masses, but also on the number of neutrinos. And the cosmological bound is 3.1. So according to cosmology, there are only three neutrinos, period. So, so all this question is uh, very hypothetical. On the other side, in a few years, we will know this by direct measurements at Fermilab, and we will be able to understand uh, whether this is a purely uh, speculation or whether it has a physical ground. We've seen many surprises in recent years, so it could be that there is a surprise here as well. It could be that there are some additional uh, neutrinos. And uh, I think with this, I would like uh, to conclude of these lectures, and uh, please ask me questions if you have any questions related to these uh, three lectures. Maybe we can put on the light in case. Uh, So there are uh, several experiments now that are trying to do this. So you uh, built some, uh, some um, uh, detectors that are sensitive to electrons uh, of coming out in the process. And, uh, and you measure the spectrum of that, uh, uh, of those electrons. And, uh, um, 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 an example is uh, the quarter experiment where the detectors are bolometric detectors. I do not know the details of the experiment, but uh, they, what they do is they measure the spectrum. Now, unfortunately, since zero neutrino it happens at the same time as two, two neutrino, the uh, spectrum is dominated by the two neutrino, which occurs. And so what you have to do is look at the end of the spectrum to see whether there is a little bump. And in fact, maybe I can use the blackboard to illustrate this point. So maybe we can close this. We can, uh, so.
So you measure the uh, uh, electron spectrum as a function of the energy of the electron. And the two neutrino gives rise to a continuous spectrum, which say goes like this, or uh, the, uh, the basic spectrum, whatever it is. And so what you are looking is for a little bump here. And so what they do is they give a limit to what they see there. And, uh, and uh, 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 on the basis of that limit, you determine the limit of the electron. So this is the, it's a function of the uh, energy of the electron. Yeah. And the original claim of Glaptor was that the, in the decay of germanium, here they see the bump. But if you look at the data, the data are like this. So, very hard to say that he has actually seen the bump. But he was insisting on this for, for many years. So all the later experiments have been able to have a, a, a sensitivity which is well below the bump seen by Klopter. So that's, uh, that's uh, yes. Yes. Okay. The distribution. There is an assignment. So, if it will be observed, then you can use this. But first you have to observe it, okay? So, for two neutrinos, this is one thing that they can measure. And in fact, the next generation of two neutrino, two, two neutrino experiment is going to measure the angular correlation. No, no, it's not a symmetry, it, it is, it, it is, uh, no, what I meant is that, uh, that uh, um, it is symmetric around the pi over 2, but it has a peaks at the pi equal to, at the angle equal to 0. This is uh, theta 1, 2, the angle between the two electrons, and it's the same at 0 and at pi. What? There is no anisotropy, but there is, uh, there is, uh, it is uh, the cross, uh, the, this is of the type A0, plus A1 cosine theta 1, 2. Oh, there could be higher order terms. We have stopped at the cosine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because the next order term is of the order alpha relative to that. And so alpha is 1 over 137. So, uh, so that's why. We stopped there. But, uh, you know, if you do want to do a very, uh, there, there could be additional terms. Okay, there are the uncertainty coming from the nuclear physics calculation, and that calculation has many steps. So each of the steps has some uncertainties. And so, okay, the, the uncertainty in the atomic physics part is small. Now that we have done the relativistic calculation and, uh, and we have done the electron cloud, so, I mean, you could do a better work instead of doing a, a Thomas Fermi, you could do the Archifoc for atoms, but that's too complicated, and uh, the uncertainty there is of the few percent. The main uncertainty, unfortunately, is just nuclear physics, the main uncertainty. Okay. And of course, the fact that we don't know or the other thing. The other. So, so, so. No, the atomic physics uncertainty is now reduced quite a lot. And that's the reason why everybody now is using this uh, 
is calculations of DNA. The, Yes. For the two new genomes, yes, of course, has been measured. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's important for quora. Yes. Yes, very precisely. In fact, uh, Oliviero Cremonesi came to see me. We discussed this. He took the programs to Milan, and now they are using the programs in Milan. They are, they are doing. And also, Gerda is using the, our calculations. Uh, Stefan uh, Schoenert is uh, the, this person. So for the experimentalists, this calculation of phase-based factors has been crucial uh, uh, for, uh, um, for the, uh, it's, it's important for them. Vari ringraziamenti, è stato veramente un piacere e mi ha fatto particolarmente piacere anche partecipare a queste, a queste lectures, è molto interessante, molto, soprattutto proiettato verso il futuro, chiaramente. Ci sono tante cose in cui c'è l'interesse dell'INFN, ma in generale della fisica ovviamente. Quindi grazie, questo è una, un arrivederci. Quindi, alla, come, fatemi fare un piccolo ringraziamento ma importante ai servizi multimediali di GSI che curano, eh, hanno curato queste riprese e poi eh, che saranno tradotte in un DVD eh, come in generale si fa in questi casi e quindi rimarrà memoria anche eh, storica di questo, di questo evento. Grazie anche a loro. Mi associo alle parole di Leonardo e ringrazio veramente moltissimo Franco. Questa è stata veramente, diciamo, la sua, il, diciamo, queste lecture della sua presenza qui è stata particolarmente significativa per noi, anche perché, eh, come appunto ha detto Franco, chiaramente la fisica del neutrino, doppio beta di Kenia, è al centro dell'Istituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare come interesse. E in particolare io voglio dire anche per la sezione di Napoli, perché come sezione di Napoli sai bene appunto che diciamo, per la fisica del neutrino diciamo a radici lontane e si è sviluppata negli anni della nostra sezione quindi diciamo eh, il significato veramente è molto molto particolare di questa lecture che tu eh, ci hai fatto e poi voglio aggiungere che in questa iniziativa che ne abbiamo avuto eh, nell'INFN What Next che tu conosci benissimo è chiaro anche lì chiaramente il doppio beta di Key la massa del neutrino, la fisica del neutrino in generale è al centro e nel futuro come ha detto Leonardo dell'INFN quindi grazie ancora Franco veramente